three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God. In the place which he chooses at the feast of unleavened bread and at the feast of weeks and at the feast of booths. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. You shall appoint for yourselves judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial, and you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. For the past few weeks, we have studied through the three mandatory feasts of Israel. And we, we discussed, we fleshed out the beautiful message that those three feasts declare to us. That each of them has a message, but then when you put them all together, there's this wonderful flow that comes out of it. That message coming out of the three feasts acts as the foundation for what we're going to go through next. As we see another aspect of the brilliance of God, that the Bible is an inexhaustible book. Now this idea is both simple and overwhelming. It's one of the ones that caused me to fall in love with the Bible the way that I have. Growing up in church, I kind of thought I knew all of the Bible stories. I could, I could do any sword drill up in front of the church with the best of them. Give me a passage and I could find it. And I thought because I understood these few things, I knew everything the Bible had to offer. But eventually my life ran into situations where it didn't seem like the Bible could answer. But when you start to understand this, as deep as you want to go, you can always go further. It shows you the possibilities of what the Word of God can do. For a lack of a better example, it's like trying to figure out the number of possible outcomes for any given situation. The more number of factors you include into it, the more complicated you make the situation, the greater the possible outcomes that can come out of it. The same thing is true for the Bible. That if you take one section of it, yes, it has one truth, it has one message, one thing that it's trying to reach you about. But when you start to see that through the prism of other passages of, of the Bible, you see how quickly complicated and beautiful it can become. So what we see here in chapter 16 going into chapter 17 is not just a section on the Feast of the Lord and then a section on justice. But what we notice is that there's a flow of the chapter and that the two sections are not unrelated, but rather each one builds and flows through the next. For while, yes, there is only one meaning, only one truth to each portion of Scripture, there are limitless ways that we can apply that truth to our life. And this is how the Bible can always relate to our lives. Because no matter how unique or nuanced or complicated our lives might be, the Bible can always address it. Now, here's the frustrating part it may not give us the ready-made answer we often want. So often, we just want to be told what to do. It doesn't always work like that. But the principles of the Bible always apply. In verse 16, we see the requirement of the Lord, that the, the attendance for these feasts were required for all Jewish males every year. Not some years, not leap year, every single year, every single Jewish male who could attend was required to attend. Now, as we mentioned previously, this is not a command meant to exclude the women. The women of Israel are always welcome to attend. But what God was doing was laying two expectations upon the men. One is the command in verse 16. Three times a year, you must appear. The second command is found at the end of verse 16 and at the beginning of verse 17. You shall not appear empty-handed, but rather you will give according to you how you have received. I, I've said this in previous studies here recently. And again, I repeat myself because it needs to be repeated. God does not want your stuff. And God never, ever needs your stuff. The Lord is never at the risk of going bankrupt. The church will never close because you don't give. God doesn't even need the worshiper to go first. He doesn't go, you give me, and then I give you. 
Because verse 17 tells us the worshiper was to give according to what they had already received. God always goes first. Therefore, we are not to appear empty-handed. Israel was not to appear before the Lord empty-handed because their hands were not empty. Their storehouses were full. Their wallets were stuffed. And because God had been so generous to them, they were to bring a tithe to the Lord in acknowledgement of what he had already done for them. Now, here's where the brilliance of God really shines forth. Starting in verse 18, God appears to change gears and begins discussing things related to justice and law. It seems like a totally different section, right? You shall appoint yourself judges who will judge with righteous judgment. As a nation, you shall not distort justice, do not be partial, do not take bribes. Now, that seems pretty self-explanatory. We shouldn't have to explain that too much. And in case we miss the idea, verse 20 puts it in beautiful, flowery language. Justice and only justice you shall pursue. It's a beautiful, beautiful line. Jesus will put this even more directly in John chapter 7, when during the Feast of Tabernacles, he teaches the people, do not judge according to how something looks on the outside. Do not be partial to how someone appears, but justice and only justice you will pursue, judge with righteous judgment. Now, here's the brilliance of our God. In Deuteronomy 16, God follows up the command for the people to observe the Feast of Tabernacles with the command to judge with righteous judgment. And in John chapter 7, Jesus, who was attending the Feast of Tabernacles, commands the people to do what? To judge with righteous judgment. So what does this little fact tell us? It tells us that the two are related. We will see this clearly demonstrated in chapter 17, verse 4, when God combines the laws that govern Israel's worship with the command for righteous judgment to fully investigate any reports of pagan worship occurring in the land. So if we back all the way up, we'll see that the Lord will address the worship of Israel in verses 1 through 17 of chapter 16. Then he addresses justice in verses 18 through 20 of the same chapter. Worship again, verse 21 and 22, and then justice and worship together in chapter 17. By going back and forth and back and forth, God is weaving these two ideas together. And by having multiple feasts throughout the year, the worshiper is constantly reminded every single year of the heart of God. And the heart of God is this. The Lord desires mercy not sacrifice. This is the message that so many miss when studying the law. We often see the Old Testament in terms of rules and commands, of declarations and consequences. But from beginning to end, there is only one heart. Mercy, mercy, mercy for those who have a heart for him. In Matthew chapter 12, where we see this verse, Jesus and his disciples were walking through a grain field on the Sabbath. We're told the disciples became hungry. They began to pluck heads of grain and eat them, which was permitted under the law. But this day was the Sabbath. And part of the reason why Israel had been displaced from the land during the reign of the kings was because they had neglected the Sabbath and the Sabbath year. Because of this, God kept Israel out of the land for 70 years. When they returned, they were determined to never mess up this aspect of their relationship with God ever again. But in their zeal, they ended up violating other aspects of the relationship with God. And the religious elite, particularly the Pharisees, elevated rules over people. So when they saw hungry disciples, hungry disciples eating the grain, they chastised Jesus for what they thought was a broken rule. But he quickly explains to them, you have it all wrong. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You were not created just to observe rules. If you had known God's heart, you would have known that the Father desires compassion, not sacrifice. He doesn't want your stuff. If you'd known that he wanted your heart, you would not have condemned those who had done nothing wrong. Please understand, God is not saying don't judge at all. 
This is what the world often says to us as it misquotes and misapplies Matthew chapter 7. For not only does the world ignore that Jesus commands us to judge in John chapter 7, we already saw that, but they conveniently lead out that in this very chapter of Matthew, we're told to judge the fruit of one another. Instead, what Matthew 7, 1 actually tells us is that if we judge one another unfairly or with, without, or with bias, if we judge one another without mercy or grace, then that is how God will judge us. But if we judge with righteous judgment, with mercy, and with truth, then that is how God will judge us too. Please understand. Just because Jesus died for our sins doesn't mean that God ignores our sin. He knows all the sins that we have ever done. But because Jesus died for our sins, the Father chooses not to remember our sins when he looks at us. Instead, when he sees us, what he sees is that we have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. And because we love his Son, the Father declares that our sins have been paid for in full. Now we see the true meaning of Deuteronomy 16, 17. That everyone is to give as we have received. We have received mercy. We have received grace. And just as God has loved us, so should we love one another. But we don't do this by ignoring what truth actually is. Listen, the Bible has no kind words for those who would try to turn the truth of God upside down. In Isaiah 5, God says, woe, suffering, anguish to those who call evil good and good evil. But if we love the Lord and if we live in awe of who he is, then we will treat evil like the evil that it is. While the Bible is so clear on this, there is still a struggle for some Christians in our current day. Because we're being bombarded by the message that love is love. We're told that who you love is your business and who I love is mine. We're told that we have to confirm the confused choices of children. Because if we don't, it's the same as leading them to death. And if we really, really cared about others, we would let them do whatever they wanted, even if it meant the horrific mutilation of little kids. But that is wrong. That is so absolutely wrong. Remember, woe to those who call evil good. Listen, the world can say whatever it wants. But for the people of God, we cannot show mercy without first holding fast to what is true. Mercy doesn't ignore what is true. Instead, mercy stands upon what is true so that mercy can be shown. You can't pull somebody who's drowning out of the water unless you're first standing on something firm. We see this in a story told by Jesus in Luke chapter 18. In that passage, Jesus is describing a day. This isn't a hypothetical situation. He's talking about an incident that occurred. On one day, these two guys come up to the temple. One is a Pharisee. Pharisee, the other is a tax collector. The Pharisee approached God with bravado, thanking God that he wasn't like other people, not like thieves, not like deviants, not even like that tax collector standing over there. Contrasted to the Pharisee was a tax collector who didn't even feel worthy of drawing close to God. Nor could he stay away because the tax collector understood what the Pharisee did not. And that's what he needed. Only the Lord could provide. But still, he was a sinner and he knew it. How can a sinner approach a holy God? So he stayed back at a respectful distance. He didn't even lift his eyes up. Instead, he beat his own chest a sign on the outside of the guilt he felt on the inside. And he didn't try to tell God how great he was. Instead, he cried out, I am a sinner. Please have mercy on me. Jesus gives the conclusion. The one who seemed like he did everything right, he was not justified. But it was the tax collector the pariah to the Jewish world. That one went home, made right in the Lord's eyes. Because the one who denied what he was, he exalted himself. 
but it was the one who was humble, who saw himself as he really was. That was the one who could be raised up by the Lord. As Jesus said in John chapter 9, if the Pharisees could only see that they were blind, then Jesus could have helped them see for truth. But because they thought they could see, then they were refusing to give Jesus the freedom that he would need in order to open their eyes. Even in the merciful heart of God, sin is still sin. And justice, and only justice, we shall pursue. But this demand for justice is not made at the expense of the people. The demand for justice was designed to benefit the nation as a whole. Fair, undistorted justice, and judges who would not take bribes, these were meant to be a protection over the people. And it would be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. This is why God prohibits any type of perversion of justice. The Lord is a righteous judge. And because he is not corrupt, and he will not corrupt what is just, neither should those who are his people. For to treat one person one way and to treat another another is an abomination to the Lord. So where does that leave us? Because it seems like after reading verse 20 in chapter 16, it's all justice and there is no room for mercy for us. And that would be the conclusion if this section wasn't tied to what came before it. If it wasn't connected to the beautiful story of the three mandatory feasts. That we are sinners who needed saving. And Jesus died for us. And he didn't just die for us. He rose again for us. He poured out his very spirit upon us. And even now he dwells here with us. Now, the true beauty of this passage should start to be apparent. God's not raising a bunch of spoiled brats who think we can do what we want when we want. Our sin is still sin. It doesn't matter how much he loves us. That sin still demands a price. A holy God must judge sin. A righteous king must demand blood for blood. And so the Lord God of the universe acknowledged that we were guilty. And then he stepped down from his throne. He hung on a cross. And he paid that price for us. In Isaiah 53, the, the prophet Isaiah disclosed to Israel a prophecy of the Messiah. It was too hard to believe. He foretold the Messiah would come from a humble beginning. That he would not be striking in his appearance. The people who judged by the outside would not be drawn to him. That was hard enough to believe. How can we not be drawn to the Messiah when he appears? But then God, speaking through Isaiah, tells us this. Surely our griefs he himself would bear. And our sorrows, he would carry those too. The people at the cross would think that this Messiah deserved his fate. When in truth, he was the only innocent man in the world that day. And the reason he was crucified was to save us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sin. The chastising that we deserved fell upon him. And by his stripes, his stripes, we are healed. No, the Lord does not wink at sin. He hates evil. And it can only be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. So our God, ever merciful, he died for us. And he paid the price for our sins. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. And I thank you for your spirit that would cause my heart to break. That words like this can't be said lightly because this is what our Jesus has done for us. Father, you are a just God. A righteous king you must be righteous all the way through. Somebody had to pay the price. But it was a price we could not pay. Lord, I love you, but I thank you for the love that Jesus has for us, that for the joy that was set before him, 
He despised the shame of the cross. He stepped right over it with the heart that said, nothing will keep me from my beloved. Nothing will stop me from saving those that I love. Father God, we thank you for this passage. For all we see is the mercy of our King that fulfilled all of this for us. There is no God but you. No one has ever loved us this way. And we thank you, mighty God, for what we're about to do. Oh, Lord, please be with us this day. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It just so happens that today is communion, where we stop everything and we remember what it is that our Jesus